Hello everyone, welcome to part 2 of Here's the Execution Plan, Now What? This is a series of videos where I try to gap the bridge between the nice, clean, uh, simple execution plans we get in our theory lessons and the messy reality of execution plans we have to work with in our everyday life. In order to bridge this gap, I use sample execution plans that are somewhat realistic and of medium complexity, so a bit in between those two extremes, and I try to talk you through the steps of how I can use information in the execution plan to find how to solve a problem. This is the second video. The first one was about excessive I.O. There will be a link in the description, so check it out if you're interested. This video, we're going to talk about an issue with high resource semaphore weights. So let's just jump right into the demo and see how we handle this. Good. We have our demo here. And the issue we had, like I said, is high resource semaphore weights. Now, if you've never heard that term before, don't be ashamed. It is a not a very common issue, luckily. But a resource semaphore weight occurs when a when a query starts executing and it requests memory, but the server doesn't have that memory available. So either there are too many other queries requesting memory, or a few memory queries requesting insane amounts of memory. Either way, the total amount of memory requested by all concurrent executing queries is higher than what the server has available. And obviously, then we have to wait until memory starts getting available, and that is recorded in the wait stats as a resource semaphore wait. Now, in this scenario, a senior DBA has identified the root cause of slowness on our system as a single stored procedure that causes way too much resource semaphore waits. And that stored procedure is here. It's called paginated sales report. And if I just execute this store procedure, you will see that it returns a total of 20 rows, that's all, with some information. And this query, this store procedure happens to be called from a dashboard that continuously refreshes on lots of monitors throughout the organizations. So there's hundreds, maybe thousands of computers, and each of them executes this store procedure every half minute or so, and all those executions combined cost more memory than the server has available, and that slows down everything. Every, not just this query, but every query that requests memory now has to wait, because there's two much memory consumption. So how do we tackle this? Of course, we start by looking at the store procedure itself. So let's uh, connect to the correct uh, uh, instance in the correct database. And uh, let's open up the text of the store procedure. And because I'm lazy, I click modify, not because I want to modify it, but because this is the fastest way to get the text. And the first thing I notice is that there is actually an optional parameter here. So it is called, let's return to where we called it, it's called without a parameter. So this dashboard always calls it with a default value of 1. But it can also be called with another parameter. So I ask around, and then I learn that from the dashboard, those people who get the dashboard on their own system, have an option to click through and then see more information. And that's where this parameter is used. But the biggest problem is not those 10 or 20 times a day someone wants to see more details. The biggest problem is the millions of times per day that this sales report runs with the default parameter from this dashboard. So that's where we need to focus. Now, if I look at the store procedure, I see that we create a temporary table, and then we put some data in that temporary table. And that data is produced here in this select that joins aggregated sales data, and aggregated sales data is this CTE. So here, what we do is we join the sales order header to the sales order detail, 
to get the sales information. And that is grouped by product ID special several values. And those are then returned together with the sum of the order quantity. That data is then joined to a product table, a special offer table, and a few more tables. Because in the final select, we don't want the product ID, we want the product number. We don't want the special offer ID, but we want the corresponding, uh, sorry, that's the wrong highlight. We want the corresponding discount percentage, and so on, and so on. And this is then ordered. Uh, that's a bit weird. Why are we ordering an insert in two? I'll get back to that later. Um, there is another statement that we simply return some rows from this table based on a row ID value between two values. And for page number one, the default, the case where we need to optimize, 1 times 20 minus 19 is 1, and 1 times 20 is 20, so this is row ID between 1 and 20. Now this row ID value is not even inserted here. So let's go back to the declaration of the table, and here we see that row ID is an identity column. And now this order by here also starts to make sense, because if you use an order by on an insert in two, you will get the data inserted in that order, and you get the identity values in that order. So the identity value one corresponds to the row with the highest total order quantity, two is the second highest, and so on. So we add all the data we get into this all results temporary table with a row number that is generated as an identity based on a descending total order quantity. And then for the default case, we only return rows 1 to 20. But if we call it with row ID 2, it will be rows 21 to 40. For row ID 3, it will be rows 41 to 60. So in effect, we have a pagination mechanism created. And that's what this store procedure does. On the dashboards, it shows the 20 top sales. And if people want to see more, they can click through and go to the next pages. Now, apparently, this store procedure requests too much memory. Let's find out where the issue is. And by the way, I forgot to call that out. But one thing I did notice when I opened this store procedure is that there are exactly zero comments in it. That's annoying, but that's also a thing of reality. Like I said in the uh, 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 when I uh, at the start of this video, I designed these examples to be realistic. And realistically, when you end, uh, start maintaining someone else's system, you will run into store procedures that are not commented. That's annoying, but it's reality. So in this case, we only had to code uh, had the code to go by. Mm. My bad, bad, I wanted to click here. So what we now do is we're going to execute the store procedure again, but now with the execution plan with runtime statistics enabled. And we have the results and we see because there are two queries in the store procedure, we'll also see two execution plans, one for query one and another one for query two. If you look at the memory consumption, one place where you can do that is to simply hover your mouse over the top left operator, and then you will see that there is a memory grant here of 49 megabytes. Now that is in reality quite low. I'm doing this on a demo system with relatively small tables, just the AdventureWorks sample database. So let's assume for the sake of this demo that 49 megabytes is actually too much. That would never be the case in real systems, but bear with me, this is a demo. So we need to get this down. The second query does not have a memory grant. And if you click and go to the properties, you can also see that the memory grant here is more detailed, but still shows zeros. That doesn't mean it uses zero memory. Every query always uses a bit of memory, but there's no special extra memory. So all the memory grant problems are in the top query. Now, you might be tempted to look at certain operators and then use the memory usage information you have in the execution plan here. Resist the temptation, because this is the actual memory usage. But resource semaphore means that SQL Server cannot give the memory grant that was requested. 
So perhaps the memory grant was too high. We asked for 49 megabytes, but we used only 5 megabytes. So we can look at how much memory each operator used, but I am not interested in that. I am interested in how much each operator contributes to the requested memory. And that's where the memory grant comes in. But there is a problem that we, you are now running into, and that is that the memory grant is not exposed on a per operator basis. So what you have to do instead is use your own knowledge of operators and their memory usage. And not everyone has that knowledge, so there will be a link in the description to the execution plan reference where you will find a lot of documentation on individual operators, including their memory usage. Now, I do know that a sort operator has to store its entire input in memory. So if I look at the estimation of the input size, I'm not going to look at the actual number of rows, I'm looking at the estimated number of rows, or rather, SQL Server has already computed it for me. There's an estimated data size of 12 megabytes, which is based on this estimated number of rows and this estimated average row size. So 12 megabyte is the estimated memory usage for this sort. A hash match operator also uses memory, and if a hash match inner join stores its top input. So now we only have to look at the size of the top input, which for this hash match is Ne negligible. It's almost nothing, just 240 bytes. So this is not the problem. But if I look at the rest of the execution plan, you will see that there are more hash match operators. I'm not going to click and look at each and every one of them. Of course, if you're really going to do this, you will have to do that. But this is a demo, so I'm going to just show you how to do it and not do every step and all the repetitions. However, there is something I need to call, call out, and that is that all the way below, there's another hash match, that's a hash match aggregate. And for a hash match aggregate, the memory usage is not the input, but the output. For a hash match aggregate, the memory usage is based on the estimated size of the output, which in this case is 3.6 megabytes. Now, if you take the time to go through all the operators in this execution plan, you will find that the biggest memory user is this sort operator that requests a total of 12 megabytes. This is only a quarter of the 49 megabytes we have in total, but SQL Server also adds a layer of security on top because every time we run out of memory, we have to spill to temp So SQL Server plays it safe and always adds a nice percentage on top of these estimations to make sure that hopefully, if the estimates are not too far off, we can still do everything within the allocated memory. This 12 megabyte is the biggest contributor. So what I want to do is try if I can find a way to fix this sort. And now I'm going to do two things. I'm going to realize two things. The first is I don't have to optimize all usages of this store procedure. I only have to optimize the stored uh, procedure for the default case, page number one. That was 99% of the executions. Those few times we execute with a different page number, I don't care about that. That's the total number of executions is so low that they will not bring down the server. It's all those concurrent executions with the default that bring up the total memory consumption too high. So I only need to optimize for the case where I need the first 20 rows. And here I'm sorting the entire input, returning the entire input, because I might need different data. But in the default case, I only need the first 20 rows. And I happen to know that the sort operator has a variety, a logical variation called the top n sort, where only the first X number of rows are returned after sorting, but all within one single operator. This top n sort for values of n below 100 is far more effective in memory usage. It uses a bit more CPU, but saves a huge amount of memory. So what I really want to do is to rewrite the query 
so that for the default case of page number one, the sort operator will not be used, but the top n sort will be used. So here's what I did. I created a new version of the store procedure. And I'll first scroll to the bottom, to the else case. This here is just a copy paste of the original code. It didn't change anything. Just simple copy paste. This is the else case. At the top, there's a page number one. So here, this part I'm going to talk about later is the special case for page number one, which is actually used 99% of the time. The generic case for all other page numbers, I'm not going to optimize. That's why I just used copy paste of the code. I'm not even going to check whether I can do something there because that's not going to solve the problem that the organization has right now. To solve the problem of the organization, I'm going to create a new version only for page number one. And here I'm not using a temporary table. I just have a top 20 in the store procedure because I know for page number one, I would store everything in the uh, temporary table and then pick the first 20 rows. Well, let's just pick the first 20 rows right away. This saves the overhead of the temporary table, which is nice, but not the problem we were solving. But what I hope to achieve is that SQL Server will now give me an execution plan with the top end sort, which will reduce the memory footprint of this store procedure. Of course, hoping that something happens and having it actually happen is not always the same. So let's create the store procedure and check what happens. So I'm going to execute it with the default parameter. So I now will get the new code path. And if I execute it, you will get the same 20 rows back. And in the execution plan, you will now indeed see that there's just one query. And if I hover here, I immediately see that the memory grant has indeed been reduced from 49 megabytes to 26 megabytes. That's a nice reduction, but I have a feeling it's not enough. I also noticed something else, and that, that, that's that there is a separate top operator here. And if I scroll to the right, I see that the sort operator is still there and it still processes the same amount of rows. Its memory usage has been reduced. That's one of the reasons why the total memory grant is lower. And that's because we have smaller columns here. The previous execution plan, we sorted the data after adding all those description columns. Here we sort the data where we have the ID columns that haven't joined yet. SQL Server has now chosen to first sort the entire set, not a top end sort, return the entire set, and then ask for 20 rows and join while doing that. Now, why did SQL Server not do a top 20 here and combine it? Because that's what I was hoping for, to have a top 20 here so that it can be combined. And then we can do those clustered index seeks and nested loops to get the rest of the data. The problem here is SQL Server doesn't know enough about the data. SQL Server says if I have 20 rows here, where I'm on, if I just return 20 rows from the sort by using a top 20 sort, and I then join to the customer data, perhaps the customer ID doesn't exist. Now suddenly I have just 19 rows. Or perhaps there is a duplicate. There are two customers with that customer ID and then I have 21 rows. But the user wanted to have 20 rows. So the only way to guarantee that the output will actually have 20 rows is to have the top operator there after those joins that might impact the total number of rows. We didn't tell SQL Server all the information we had, because I know that all those joins are guaranteed, but I didn't define my constraints the way I should have. If you ever wonder why we, you should define your constraints in the database and not enforce them at the application level only, well, this is one of many reasons why you should. You are withholding important information from the optimizer and that means that the optimizer cannot make the decisions it could make if it had more information. You want the optimizer to know at least as much about your data as you know yourself. 
Now let's assume that in this case I cannot change the database schema. I cannot add constraints and enforce those constraints. There are reasons why I cannot do that. I still want to solve this issue. So what I do now is I'm going to take the risk myself. SQL, remember, SQL Server left this top here and didn't move it here because this part is a, has a risk, according to the optimizer, of affecting the row count. I am now going to remove that risk from the shoulders of the optimizer by telling, oops, that's the wrong uh, button, by telling the optimizer, no, here's my query, just give me the 20 highest sales and then join that to all those other tables and if that affects the row count well i don't care because i don't have a top clause here so if the final result is 18 rows or 23 i'm fine with that that's what this query says i myself know it will be still be 20 rows but the optimizer didn't but now the optimizer doesn't have to guarantee that anymore so if i now change the store procedure and run the execute the paginated sales report again now you will see that there is indeed no top here and that the top and the sort operators have been combined into this top and sort the input size is still 3.6 megabytes but the top and sort doesn't store its input it only stores the qualifying rows so far so it stores just 20 rows that's almost nothing and the effect on the total memory usage is that now the memory grant is down to just 14 megabytes so we already went from 49 to 26 and now to 14. is that low enough for this demo i'm going to show, assume it is if it isn't then you will need to look even further now all these nested loops joins don't use memory the sort the top end sort doesn't use real memory the only place where memory is still used is this hash match aggregate merge join also doesn't use memory so it's only and remember for the aggregation it's the output so it's only these 3.6 megabytes that are stored as the output of the aggregation that are still causing problems if this is still too much and you need to solve this by changing the query you will have a hard time the way to do this would be to try to get a stream aggregate but a stream aggregate only works if the data is already sorted to get the data sorted you can use a sort operator but then that sort operator is going to use memory so you don't want a sort operator and you still want sorted input that means you will need indexes that match the order of the aggregation but that might impact the the, uh, the the option for a merge join so now we're getting into the territory where perhaps you will have to say this is simply the lowest we can get or perhaps with extra indexing you can do it i haven't done this myself i haven't tried for now for this demo my goal is reducing the memory footprint of a memory from 49 megabytes to 40 megabytes is sufficient based on how often this stop procedure executes and how much memory there is in the server and what the other workload is um, there is still of course a high memory usage if someone asks for page two or three or whatever but that only happens a few times per day and that was acceptable there may be more issues in the store procedure. Um, I didn't look at those. That's something I also told you in the previous video. When you need to solve a problem, solve that problem. Don't solve all other problems you see because those problems might not hurt anyone. Of course, if you can solve something for free without doing extra effort, without incurring risks, go ahead. If you notice something that is suspect, document it make sure that when someone runs into an issue with page number two you already have documented i've optimized this for page number one but not for the rest help your future self or your future colleagues but for now you can close this ticket 
the resource semaphore weights have gone. 14 megabytes for this query for this dashboard means that the total server memory still has enough available for all the other work and queries hardly ever need to wait for memory. And you can close the ticket because the issue has been solved. In the demo, you saw how I first used the memory grant properties of the execution plan to figure out which of the queries in a multi-statement store procedure used the memory that caused the high resource semaphore weights. Then, for the offending query, I inspected the relevant operators to get insight in how much they individually contributed to the total memory grant. That gave me the knowledge to understand where I needed to start my tuning. Then I tried to come up with a better idea for, based on the query, how I personally wanted the execution plan to look because I expected that to bring a better memory grant. I changed the query to try to achieve that. And even though the resulting uh, execution plan did have a lower memory grant, it Turned out that it was not because of the change I was hoping for, because I didn't even get that change. So then I revised my strategy, I understood why my first plan didn't work, and then I came up with a new plan, a better idea, and then I did get the top end sort that I was hoping for, and an even lower memory grant. Now all of this requires an understanding of execution plans and an understanding of operators. You can learn a lot from the execution plan reference that you can find at sqlserverfast.com slash epr. Uh, it's not complete yet, but I'm working to get it as complete as possible and you will find a lot of information about operators, including how much memory they contribute to a memory grant. If you want to learn more, you can also buy access to the execution plan video training at sqlserverfast.com slash video, or you can go to lots of conferences and other places where you can find information. Of course, the links that are on your screen right now will also be in the description below this video. So go click on them if you're interested. That's all I have. If you have any questions relating to, to what I described in this session or related to execution plans in general, query tuning in general, please reach out to me. You can mail me, you can tweet me. I always try to respond. If I don't, that's not because I hate you. It's just because I'm too busy. I overlook your mail. So just send me a reminder. Of course, you can also use the co comment section below to leave your comments or to ask questions. And also, please don't forget to click the like button, nice for me, and to click the subscribe button, which is nice for you, because then you will get a notification when my next video is up. My name is Hugo Cornelis. I want to thank you for watching this video, and I hope you learned something from it. Bye-bye.